Hi. Hey, everybody. Wow, this is great. Good morning, South by Southwest. So I am, as you heard, the Chief Technology Officer of Paramount Global, which is the parent company of a lot of brands you may know and recognize, like Paramount Pictures, CBS. Um, and as the Chief Technology Officer, I am what I need to be at the moment. And what that means is I help the company you know, look at all of the technology trends that are impacting media at large and then figure out which of those I really need to lean into. And it changes. And in fact, what I'm gonna talk about today was changing up until about 10 o'clock last night. Because as we go through and look at how fast technology's evolving, and I won't even say the two letters yet, but we'll get there. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I, think, you know, I feel like we have to kind of iterate on quickly. So to get started, um, I'm gonna roll a quick video here um, to give you a sense of what Paramount is and the breadth of the company. Let us go. Paramount is stories that resonate, competitions that celebrate, journeys that captivate. Stars shine brighter. Our movies fly higher. Our shows hit harder. Our events go bigger. Our fans connect deeper. Popular is why we laugh, <laughs> share, I know. scream. Lend a hand, give a damn. Popular is. Anything you want to add? I'm good. Paramount. Lest you forget, it's all about the content. And Paramount is an umbrella that encapsulates, as you can see, a wide range of creative outputs from animations to live action. Um, we just did the Super Bowl, that was kind of big. Um, to scripted dramas, and obviously, you know, or feature films. So trying to look at technology across that wide range of creative production processes and outputs um, is a bit daunting at times, because we have to apply different technologies um, applicable to those different parts of the businesses as they evolve. But I've spent my entire life, it feels like, at least the last um, couple decades, looking at technology trends, and most importantly, where they converge. And it's all been through the lens of media. And we need to remember, even at a moment where there's a bit of fear and trepidation about technology, which there generally is, is it becomes disruptive to some extent. We have to remember that all of modern media is built on technology. And I, you know, I reinforce this internally. We are not a technology company at Paramount. We are a content company. And our technology teams are there simply to serve the creative output and to facilitate the storytelling that comes out of our businesses. But we need to remember that our whole industry was built on the back of technology. And that technology drives creativity. And you know, Paramount Pictures, for example, founded in the early 20th century. Um, a few decades before that, the most engaging entertainment anyone could consume was a book. And people in the late 19th century, late, I think it was 1890 era, were fascinated when they could see a moving picture. It wasn't that long ago. But the technologies continued to evolve and change the entire process. Um, and an example here is something we call Foley. Um, we still have people doing Foley, but this was state-of-the-art technology I think this is from the 1940s. 
very creative use of technology at that time. I don't know, I just love that this guy figured out to make the sound of a frog, he's gonna put a bow on a string. And I look at that and say, we've got modern versions of that. I was just at a conference in um, Rancho Mirage or you know, Palm Springs, California a couple weeks ago, and I saw a bunch of young creatives stringing together AI systems to create new ideas and new outputs in ways that no one had imagined before. And that's you know, what I'm looking at, saying, look, this technology is definitely gonna change the way we're producing content. It's gonna be wide ranging, but we need to make sure that we're looking at this in, through the right lens. And when we look at emerging technology trends, and I'm not gonna list them all here, and I'll preface this by saying I know that the subject of this talk mentioned NFTs. I'm not gonna talk about NFTs. And not that that's a bad thing, but it's, you know, it's past its prime. But those are experiments we ran. We actually launched Star Trek Enterprise NFTs because we experiment with all of these technologies constantly. Um, we've pushed quite a bit on things like cloud um, production and media. We've now moved our entire company to a cloud-based model. That was a big technology trend we jumped on a few years ago. Um, and then we're also you know, playing around with immersive experiences. Um, and we're not sure where that's gonna go yet. We don't know whether it's gonna be something like the Sphere, which if you haven't seen the Sphere, it's amazing, as an immersive experience. Or it could be implants someday, who knows, if Elon Musk gets his way. Um, but it could be the glasses that so many people have been trying to develop for the last, God, it's over 10 years at this point, I think, since I put on my first Google Glass at that point. And I'm hopeful, because I like that. It's a great experience. But um, we play around with it. And just to give you a sense of that, um, we um, just highlight here a little game we made that was an immersive experience. Sorry. And this is just on the Paramount Pictures lot. We set up a little game where you could run around. And this is a live capture, somebody with a headset on um, capturing jellyfish. And we didn't do this because we felt like we would release this as a commercial product. We did it because we wanted the people on the Paramount Pictures lot to expand their thinking about where gaming engines could play a role in um, creating interactive experiences, but even in core production. So we have gaming engines everywhere now. And I'll talk a little bit about virtual sets as another interesting technology trend given where LED technology has evolved. So super interesting stuff. We're playing around with all of that as much as we can. But you know, beyond all of those things, gaming engines, cloud, everything else, um, in the spirit of, of what's present today, there's only one technology that trumps them all, and we know what it is, and it's the Gen AI arms race. And I'm not a hypester. I'm actually, as I've gotten longer into this, I'm a little bit of a pessimist because I've been wrong most of my life predicting how fast technologies will evolve. I thought that streaming would take over the television industry in 2008, 2009. I actually started an internet streaming company in 2006 at the same time Netflix was pivoting from shipping disks. I said, you know, this whole thing's gonna crumble in about three to five years. Oops. Um, it's about five to six years more than that. And what's interesting when you look at those technology trends, particularly as it relates to the internet disruption to the core television business, it was really like a 25 year trajectory. I mean, Real Networks came out with the first sort of commercial video streaming solution, I think it was 1998. And it took that long for the infrastructure and then for the industry to, and the consumers uh, to catch up to that. Um, but the difference in this, this arms race that we're facing right now is that it's not new. This didn't just emerge. We all know this has been going on for quite a, quite a while. The level of investment is, is unprecedented. Um, the breakthroughs that we're seeing with these systems is really interesting. But I put this you know, overly wordy slide up here to highlight the fact that it's not just what OpenAI is doing or what Google's doing. It's a confluence of the compute technology getting to a point where it could support that level of processing, where the cost of compute and storage and distributed networking declined to a point where you could do things at that next couple orders of magnitude to an unlock what's happening right now. And it's not just the big foundation models, and we'll talk about that a little bit. I think the players that are on the top of that slide creating the applications that make it accessible and adopted are just as important. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And the other reason I think this is, is so compelling besides the pace of change, which we'll talk about, 
is the number of players that are emerging that are really interesting and significant and how quickly they're shifting. I mean, they're shifting their businesses to AI faster than they shifted to the internet. So even when Bill Gates pivoted Microsoft to say, look, every product, every application is gonna have an internet feature in it and we're gonna jam the browser, explore into everything that's going on. It took a few years to get there and it was a little clunky. It's not unlike what's going on now with Copilot and AI. Um, but when you look at you know, all this collection of companies that are out there right now, I mean, it's really interesting. And as I said, that inner ring, powerful. The foundation models are going to be the engine. Um, but that outer ring that has the application providers that are going to ma really make this more accessible and usable for media in particular is where I'm spending a, a, sig a significant amount of my time as well. So a super interesting time. So when we look at all of this, you know, would be remiss as a CTO not to have a, a vision statement. And you know, we've, we've looked at this a few times, but I think it's really important to parse these kind of things and, and again, focus on the content. So we're gonna leverage the AI explosion. And last night we changed the word explosion to 10 different words, 10 different times, because some of them are a little negative and scary, some of them are too hypey. I think explosion maybe captured it. If you have a better word, let me know after the talk for, so you can modify my vision. But it's really to transform our content creation um, in partnership with the broader creative community. And I think that's really key as, as we're looking at where this technology is gonna go. What I've seen that's most interesting is when creatives go in hands-on, lean into some of these systems with a creative vision. Um, and I, when I think about people that inspire me, it's somebody like a James Cameron. So James Cameron is a technologist. You know, he's a futurist, that's the name of his biography. But he he's, uses his creative vision to use, bring that technology to life. Um, or you can say it the other way around. But, but I think it's, it's really important that as we're, as a company at Paramount, we're not trying to build technology and see what people can do with it. We're starting with inspiring our creative community in what's possible and then doing a fast follow and really trying to build up capabilities for them. And this is important because when we look at where AI is gonna have an impact on our company, it's gonna impact the enterprise and you'll probably hear about that 20 times here at South By. Um, but on the production side is really where we see a huge impact. And it's everything from ideation and pre-production through to the actual production process itself. But I think in, in some ways in the near term it's gonna have the most impact post-production and marketing. We get a high volume of derivative content that's being generated. If you think of marketing, it's building on a base of existing content, and AI is really good at creating derivative content, changing style, doing, doing edits around that. But as we lean into this, um, you hear this a lot in the press. You know, what are we gonna do in terms of ethics? What are we gonna do in terms of IP? These are very serious issues, and I'm concerned about them on, on many levels. Obviously, as a large owner of IP, we want to make sure that these systems um, enable us to have a healthy business, enable our creators and IP owners to you know, continue to create at the level that they have historically. Um, but we need to do this in parallel to innovating, and that's a constant tension. And I look back to YouTube, and, and I, I had an internet music company when Napster came on the scene. And I was on the other side of it, building DRMs, working with the record labels to do things the right way, and Napster came and just blew the market open. Fortunately, it helped me because then all the labels ran over and licensed content. But I think we gotta find the balance. If we don't engage and don't work on this proactively, we're gonna have this back and forth. Um, so we are you know, working with all those companies in that universe slide uh, proactively on both sides figuring out how we can help them, because we've got a lot of great content that can be used to support models. Um, but we also need to make sure that we've got the right economics on both sides of it. So this is ever evolving. It's a, a very big regulatory issue as well um, that we're working on. So I just wanted to highlight that, that we're thoughtful about this, um, both from our interests, from the interests of the people that work for us and work with us, and the creative community as well. Like su super important. But the way we frame this is, is really, I think the key here is, is to make it clear that Gen AI is a creative assistant. Um, I have yet to see anyone type in a text prompt and generate a net new piece of content at scale with one prompt that's gonna blow people away. 
Now, people are taking different versions of that, stitching it together, and creating outputs in new and interesting ways. And we actually run little creative hackathons inside of the company with creative briefs to get people to actually go in and build with this. Inevitably, the building is very much a hybrid model right now, where you go in, whether you're using text, using image to image creation, there's always a human in there when you get to the final product. And I'd like to hope that that continues to be the case, that this is a really great set of tools that accelerate and create more ideas quicker. Um, but you know, I'm not focused at this point on the right side of this, which is productivity. I'm focused on creativity. Because that's really, you know, as a company, we're a hit-based company. So if we generate you know, a lot more content much more efficiently and nobody likes it, it doesn't feel like a winning scenario for me or for the company. So if we can spark creativity, that's where the win's going to be. What's interesting here that we're seeing as well is a shift in the creative process, which is very much a waterfall type of process right now. And we see because you can iterate so quickly on new ideas, you don't have to write down an idea or have a, a line uh, producer talk to a creative team to generate ideas and maybe it comes back in a, a sort of long latency loop. Um, what we're seeing is an opportunity here is a much compressed timeline where you can do a lot more of these things in parallel, and it starts to feel more, much more like an agile process. High iteration loops, you can try out things early on, and you're not pushing all of the work to post-production, which happens a lot now when you're creating content. You have a lot of ideas up front that you use old techniques to create. You do a lot of shooting, and then the bulk of the work for visual effects, everything else is done in this very long process. And if you, you see that with films or television, television not as much because we do those a lot faster, but for feature films, you could have everything shot and it could be another 12 to 18 months before something comes out. A 12 to 18 months is a lot of visual effects, a lot of post-production work, um, which we think you know, we could not just compress the timeline, but make it much more engaging and get new ideas out there. So it's something that you know, we're actively looking at right now. So I'm going to apply this idea of technology of AI and give you some ideas of, and examples of what we're doing right now in the market. Um, and we'll start with pre-production. This is an obvious one. A lot of people talk about this right now. Um, going in and looking at a script, analyzing it, obviously these large language models are really good at that. They're better at it than I am at sorting my slides right now. Um, and this is something that we you know, think has a lot of usefulness, right? Just going in, summarizing text, that's great. If everybody's played around with you know, one of the, the language models, you'll know that's, that's a great output. People really start talking about, oh, I'm going to create the next episode of a season of something and have Gen AI create that. We actually run experiments like that just for fun. Yeah, it can generate a lot of text, but it doesn't have that complete worldview to generate something that you know, we think would be that interesting and compelling right now. Um, but this, this idea of summarization, it works really well. One thing as well, and talking about doing more upfront, right now when we're doing this kind of motion capture and sort of replacing a human with whatever that thing is, what, what is, is that a muskrat? What is that? Does anybody know what that is? What is it? Meerkat, thank you. So. If I were up here trying to be a meerkat, I'd be sitting in a motion capture suit with lots of little dots on me. And then after everything was shot, we would do the visual effects over that. This is a great example where in real time on set, the creative team can see what it's going to look like. Um, and we hope that that creates some new, quicker ideas on things they may want to change um, going forward. So on location work and seeing real time uh, feedback is, is really interesting. The other area that we see a lot of interest, and Sarah, is this, is this it? This is it, OK. Get ready. So in localization, um, really interesting, because now we have to take a show, release it around the globe in multiple languages in a time frame that has, is impossible with traditional approaches. So we're looking at you know, how can we use AI technology to do the, the translation in a a voice accurate way um, using some of these AI techniques. So forgive me now for what you're about to go through. I'm going to show you an example of one of our, our pieces of content translated using different versions of AI. There you go. So that's the original English. And this is with the traditional human dubbing. 
now synthesized, so AI-generated voice in Hungarian. Yeah. So, so what's interesting about that, besides it being such a great song, um, a couple of, of things that we learned doing that. Um, obviously, you know, just using that technology to quickly get things into another language, very helpful. We actually learned that, that these um, technologies could harmonize. Like We'd never applied it to singing before, much less trying to get it to stay in tune. So the fact that you know, as we're applying this, we're learning things. And we always talk about emergent behaviors. I don't know if that's emergent or we just used it for the first time in that way. But super interesting, very practical. This is something that works today. So in all the theoretical uses of this technology, this is one that we see being really interesting. And when we talk about marketing and distribution, um, we need to create content that is acceptable around the globe. And that involves a lot of editing, a lot of image manipulation. So this is just a quick example here where if you look at the top images, those are the original images. And the bottom images are ones that have been modified to be appropriate for certain regions of the world. Um, and this is very easy to do with image manipulation and AI. So we're looking at these things as you know, quick ways to enhance the output, because we generate tens to hundreds of thousands of pieces of marketing material every year. It's a huge volume. And because, as I said, it's derivative, it's actually targeted really well for this. So one thing that we looked at, I've talked about a lot of applications of this, but we recognize that as I mentioned before, we have a lot of intellectual property. We want to use it, but we don't want everyone else to use it because it's our competitive advantage. So we looked at it, how are we going to create our own models based on our intellectual property? And it's not trivial. We're not going to go out and build a foundation model. Even though we've got an incredible amount of content, we don't have enough to create a foundation model. So we looked at, should we fine tune the very large existing models? And we looked at that last year, and it's like, you know, it's just not enough. Um, out there in terms of multimodal models, which would do images, video, um, as well as text, for us to do it all ourselves. So we did partner with Adobe. And this is a very practical um, partner for us, because we've got thousands of people that use Adobe Premiere, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe After Effects. And we felt like by partnering with them, we could get this technology. They call it Firefly. I'm sure that will evolve. But their AI capabilities, getting that in the hands of thousands of people, we're going to run that experiment and, and see just how quickly um, we can you know, really get new ideas coming out. But we wanted to create a proprietary model. And, and in partnership with them, we, we're creating something that we've been calling the franchise model. And the franchise model is based on what you would expect, franchises. We have quite a few of them um, that are you know, contiguous brands, contiguous sets of content that we want to generate new content around. Pretty straightforward. But the fact that we've got existing content is really great when we want to create that new series episode film. Um, but it's really early days to figure out how we're actually going to do that. So in this case here, we partnered with Adobe and said, look, we want to create something for SpongeBob. And, and again, this is all, treat this as R&D, because um, it really is at this point. But it's, it's R&D with the creative team. So I'm not driving this from a technology perspective. Our creative team at, you know, working on this is the one that's been doing all the work. So we created a model specific for the background, because we learned one thing. You can't create one model for SpongeBob, because the Krusty Krab is a very different style than SpongeBob himself. And when we tried to create one model that covered both of them, you got some really weird looking SpongeBobs. <laughs> and it, you know, I got some scary stuff, too, which if you want to talk afterwards. Like when you just go into the Krusty Krab and you don't prompt it, it generates little green monsters. I have no idea why. Our creative team loved it, though, because like, what is this? Maybe it's a new character. I hope not, because it was terrifying. But we, by creating these two models and then bringing those together, we actually saw a real opportunity. So when we started with them, if you look at the left side here, we just went into Firefly without training it on any of our uh, intellectual property and asked for SpongeBob. And as you can see, you got a sponge. Not very good, because as Adobe has said, they are not training their model on other people's intellectual property outside of what they've got already in their stock library. So we, we train that up over time. And you can see as you go from left to right, 
as we integrated more of our content. We've learned a bit about labeling. That's a really big deal. Even though we've got a massive content of library, it wasn't labeled appropriately to train AI models. So we actually had to get a team to go in and start labeling it appropriately. And then we built a system to auto-label that using AI image detection. This is a pretty common pattern that's emerging where the AI is trained in the AI, which is um, it's interesting, and I think it just it works. Um, so we you know, made a lot of progress uh, moving from left to right there in terms of the custom model. And then the other element of this was going in and, and training our teams. So now we've got a model built up, but our teams needed to get better at coaxing that model to generate outputs that they wanted. And it's a real learning process. And if you've played around with image models, it can be frustrating because you'll enter in text prompts, you get something's pretty close, you tweak it a little bit, and then it goes off into left field. Um, so this was, this was a lot of good work. So you go from the left side, that early um, captioning, um, going into that um, middle section where we got better about the tagging and captioning, and on the right where we really did some good work on prompt development itself. And we got something that's actually viable from a production standpoint. And then the, the, the library of prompts, which this is a lot, but just to give you a sense, and this is you know, pretty common out there if you go on YouTube and say prompt engineering, you'll see a lot of this. But really going in and, and getting a vocabulary based on how we create content now camera descriptions, types of effects, types of moods. Um, but getting this as a kind of a, you know, a library of tools gives some consistency as you're generating a, a library of prompts uh, moving into the content. So we found this to be you know, very compelling. Um, and it was a proof point that it worked. And actually, the output of one of our creatathons we're hoping will be used in our marketing campaign. So we're feeling quite good about that. So that's where at least we're going in terms of doing more and more with our own IP. I'm sure the other content companies are also experimenting with that as well. Then we get into video, right? So we move beyond our images. And as we were looking at video, you know, it was clear that um, there were players out there. And I've got up here Runway and Pika. And look, they're, they're you know, leading the way. I, I met Chris from Runway at a MIT conference last year. And, um, was really impressed by the work he did at NYU. And then, I think more importantly, not only building the models, but packaging it up in tools that were actually useful for doing things like compositing, rotoscoping, just really you know, meaningful tools to fill out things. Um, but from a generation standpoint, um, we were still in a scenario where you generate three to five seconds of video, and then you'd stitch that together into something longer and then put an audio bed under that to get some continuity. And that was AI video circa 2023, right? And, and you know, there was a lot of great output there, but it was really limited by the, the architecture of those video generation systems. So it really hit me when we were looking at this and looking, where do we invest, where do we build? I said, look, on the video front, unless somebody goes in and does something pretty fundamental that gets coherence frame to frame, scene to scene in a model, um, is able to do it at a much lower price point um, to generate the video um, and solve some of the problems in terms of fidelity and coherence, it's, it's probably you know, a three to five year journey before we got you know, any meaningful video beyond 10 seconds. And you know, I was wrong. <laughs> um, then came Sora, right? So OpenAI, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, unveiled Sora. Uh, which is their latest video generation model. And, and look, you know, like everyone out there, I'm not you know, in the details of, of the architecture. I read as much as I could find and talk to OpenAI um, to you know, learn more about it. But it's clearly you know, the next high watermark in video. And it proves that we need to keep moving fast on this, that the technology is going to evolve very quickly. And if you, you know, think about what I described, those kind of three to five second videos that are interesting and creative, but still you can always identify generally when it's an AI video stylistically. Um, for those that haven't seen this, this is the example video um, that OpenAI released. And there's many more out there. And I'm not here to shill OpenAI, <laughs> to be clear. I'm here to make a point that the technology is moving fast. Um, it's something that is a creative community we have to lean into to understand not only how we can use it, but how we can shape the direction to do things that we need. And you know, as a, as a child of Silicon Valley and living in media, I know all too well that a lot of times the technology teams think they've figured out the future of media up in Silicon Valley or elsewhere, put insert technology city, Austin. Um, and um, 
it misses the mark in terms of what the creative team needs. So we're hoping that we can be you know, one of the voices involved in this kind of somewhat magical um, set of outputs that um, OpenAI put together. So I encourage you to take a look at it if you want to get inspired um, about what's possible. This is not commercially released yet, so it's still, to me, a technology proof of concept, um, but something that really points to where, where we're headed. Um, what does work today are you know, simple technologies like um, de-aging and, and facial replacement. And we, if you've seen any of the videos that have gone out, the deep fake videos and others, they're all fun, but it actually from a filmmaking and television perspective, it's really useful to be able to go in and put a character in AI makeup and have them see what that looks like in real time and adjust it in real time. Um, it's a better experience for the actors, for the creators. Um, it gives us a broader range of possibilities. This is um, an example by a company called Metaphysic, one of the companies that's really zeroed in on facial modification. There's a company, Deep Voodoo, as well, that came out of one of our, our properties, South Park. Matt and Trey just saw this coming, like, hey, we're going to create a company, because you know, they're Matt and Trey, they can do what the hell they want. But they created this company. It's actually one of the better companies now at, at doing this. So we see this as a very practical use that's widely um, adopted across the industry using traditional visual effects techniques. There's a a lot of sensitivity around where the data goes, how it's being used. So I think it's going to evolve quickly, um, but it's something that you know, certainly we, we see as really interesting. The other area that I think is, is an opportunity in the near term is that confluence of technologies here, and this is a virtual set. Um, we have these virtual sets that exist around the globe now. They're big LED volumes in which you use a gaming engine generally to generate the virtual environment. Um, and then you combine that with AI video generation. Um, it's really interesting, right? Because now, instead of having a bank of, of uh, Unreal Engine developers on set reacting, and when the director wants to do something different, like, give me two hours, I'm going to go and you know, modify the gaming engine and re-render. If you can do that much more in real time, it does start feeling like a holodeck, particularly with a natural language interface, where you do say holodeck move that wolf over to the tree from the stone, et cetera, and have that interact in real time, I think there's a lot of possibility there. Um, and it's, a, again, a very interesting combination of the technologies converging. LED costs and capability and resolution getting to the right point. Um, and then, obviously, this gaming engine be able to render on that scale of a screen. Super interesting stuff. So we're, you know, we're looking aggressively at that um, as one example of things we're working on. And then the, the other point I would make on this, besides the foundation models, it's really important to understand that it's not just about the big players. As I mentioned earlier, what I'm seeing that's most exciting is the people that are cobbling together a wide range of technologies. And this like, RAG system is called re Retrieval Augmented Generation. It basically just means you feed a lot of data into the prompts and the output to modify it. So you're kind of curating. Um, these foundation models with much more sophisticated systems, feeding them images. Um, as you saw from OpenAI, they're generating applications called GPTs around these. Those could be useful as well for production and what we're doing. Um, the databases are really interesting. What I saw um, at, at this conference I went to a few weeks ago were these small open source models that were being used, kind of like we did with SpongeBob. You create a SpongeBob model using a small very efficient, compact, um, open source model, and then use that to feed into some of the larger foundation models, types of images you wanted to modify or come up with new ideas. So, you know, and these systems are getting pretty elaborate now in terms of text inputs, images that are being manipulated and fed into the larger systems. And that's what we're looking at now in terms of what we should be building to support our creative output is a collection of these, not just going to a Google or an Adobe or an OpenAI, but really looking at that that broader um, element. The other um, opportunity that's really big right now is the team that does all the hard work but really gets recognized, our archive team. Like the archival teams are the hottest people now because they've got all the training data. So we're in there you know, figuring out how do we organize our archives 
and optimize all of our assets for use in this AI world that we're in right now. And that's really challenging to, to get it set up the right way so we can train and train and train. It's the part of the big AI war that is not talked about as much as that training data, not only just saying, hey, they scraped the internet and they trained a model, how they organize that data so they can train the next version and the next version and then take new queries and responses and feed that in. That science is one that I think is going to be most important for media companies to organize our assets to get the most value out of it. And it's something that you know, I think we're all at a very, very early stage of, of figuring out. And I used um, on the screen here the Tom Cruise Minority Report image because I, it kind of struck me that all these systems we're using to manipulate foundation models are a little bit like what they did in that movie with the precogs. If you know, the precogs are the ones sitting in there, murder, murder, right? But they weren't that useful on their own. They just sit there in water saying murder. But so they needed a lot of output and input to manipulate that basic system, and it's not unlike here. The foundation models are incredibly powerful. They're also very fallible, um, and they can be very time consuming if you don't know how to manipulate them the right way. So that's something that you know, I think is an opportunity for emerging media companies and big media companies alike. So why should you care about all this stuff? Um, I think it's multifold. One is, from, as a technologist, it's incredibly interesting, exciting, and will really drive the next phase of media in ways we don't know yet. I mean, people talk a lot about AI creating customized versions of a piece of product for a consumer. I'm actually a bit of a skeptic on that. I think people like to have a common set of content, and I don't think creatives like to have their content manipulated dynamically, but I could be wrong, and I think there's going to be a world for that. But I do think you know, how it changes innovation in the creative process and creates new experience is going to be just fascinating. Um, from a productivity standpoint, that will happen, but I'm a firm believer that we're not going to save a penny. And that's just how it goes. When you look back to nonlinear editing, when computers were first introduced in the creative process, there's a lot of talk about that, saving all this time and energy, splicing film, and, and people will move faster. We just created more content, and we had new creative outputs from that. I firmly believe that that is what's going to happen here. We'll get more efficiency, we'll get more productivity, and we'll plow those dollars back into better content. At least that's what I hope ultimately happens. Um, and then the ethics side of this and the creativity side of it, I've talked about that quite a bit. That's really the key. So if any of you are creatives, I encourage you not to just learn about the technology, but really go hands-on and start creating content. Like get inspired from a James Cameron. Have a vision from a creative perspective and then look into the technology and see, well, what's possible with that technology to really bring that vision to life. So that's, that's, that's where we are in terms of new technologies. I really appreciate your time today um, going through that. And I was just going to open it up for, um, for questions to the audience. Thank you. Hmm. So I'm reading the questions here. So the first question is, where does differentiation from the competition take place? All models, processes, et cetera, can be used by Warner Brothers Discovery, Netflix, and Disney. Well, differentiation from a content perspective is going to be with the content. So I do think that there's not going to be a lot of competitive advantage in how we build the technology systems. It's certainly going to be that underlying data set we have and those that can train it uh, quicker, use it to train models faster. So that's, that's a TBD. Um, I don't think there's any secret sauce for content companies on that right now. And the other is, what strategies are you implementing to help foster a culture of innovation within your technology team? I have to say, the way I inspire technology team is show them content. That's why I open with the sizzle reel. If you look at the output that we have with our teams, um, that inspires them to go and lean into new ideas that can support that creative output. The other is, is a lot of training. So when we converted our company from a broadcast company to an internet cloud-based company, I had to train thousands of people on a new set of technologies, and almost all of them made it to the other side. So if you give people an opportunity to learn, you give them a clear vision on where you're headed over the next couple years, you get them to, to move with you. So um, I've seen that many times to be very successful. The other is, what do you think the role of AI or other tech could be in the research process? figuring out who your customers are and what they want. I think there's a lot there. 
Um, one idea that you know, I've toyed around with is creating an AI audience. So we do a lot of research. We have a place in Las Vegas where we screen television shows or films and get reactions from panelists, basically. Um, I think if we could create AI-based panelists that model different demographics, train them up on different types of content that they like or don't like, and then use that at scale to get feedback, super interesting. You know, this was a dream from 20 years ago when I was in the music industry, as a lot of companies were saying, I'm going to create the hit detector that's going to listen to this song, <clears throat> excuse me, and generate the probability it's going to be a hit. That's just complete nonsense. Because um, you can't just from the audio itself tell what's going to be a hit. It's about the zeitgeist of the moment and the artist. Um, but I do think if you've got something with that broader view, then you can potentially do that. So I think there's a huge role in research um, going forward. So organizing the massive uh, amount of archive in the company, I can't answer that all right here. That's a, that's a, that's a big one. The biggest, the biggest one that we did was get it all in one spot. So when we moved to the cloud over the last four to five years, we did get all of our assets generally in a common content repository. And it's not organized optimally for use in AI yet, but having it all in a common content repository has really accelerated our ability to structure it for AI training and use in AI systems. So we're actually feeling quite good about that. And I'll just take a, a couple more here. Um, let me pick one that I find particularly interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Do you think the increase in the creation of content could cause audience to have content burnout? Well, I don't know. We just went through one of the most incredible explosions of content, 2021 through 2022, really, with the streaming wars. Um, and look, a lot of great shows didn't make it to the surface, and now, now they're being recirculated through other channels. So I think there's definitely a case where there's just too much content to consume. Um, and, and we're seeing that. So I just think the amount of output will moderate based on the market. So I don't see that as a real problem, um, having volume of content. It really comes down to you know, whether or not consumers are going to continue to grow their video consumption, which has been an amazing trend over the last 20 to 30 years. The volume of video consumption just keeps going up. That's why, ultimately, even with the shifts in distribution, I think video is a great business to be in. And this is a fun one. Will AI mean Tom Cruise really is ageless? He really is ageless. <laughs> um, if you saw the last uh, movie that he made, just looking at the, the stunts he was doing, it was phenomenal. But, but that aging technology, there's a film by Zemeckis that's coming out, I think it's this year, with Tom Hanks, um, this really fascinating use of aging, de-aging, where they take a character all the way through the arc of life from childhood to death using kind of a play-like set and AI aging and de-aging. So I think you'll see that become more and more seamless over time. And I'll, the last one I'll, I'll cover for today is um, how do you engage in the Gen AI arms race and do you feel you have to win or even can win? So I think the, the short answer to that is like, I'm not going to win the Gen AI arms race, but I'm going to stay really close to the people that do win. <laughs> and there's going to be a couple of them. There's not going to be, you know, at, at least from a core foundation model perspective, just looking at the economics of, of, of fighting that battle, there's going to be a handful of them. And all of them want to work with content companies. So I'm very encouraged that as a, a media company that we're going to have a key voice in the evolution of AI systems going forward. So I'm going to just wrap it up. So with that, I'll just call it a day. I'm going to stick around. If anybody has other questions they want to ask, please do. Thank you so much.